Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by myself, Nicholas Kisson, a senior advisor, a senior legal advisor at LEASE, short for Leasehold Advisory Service, and I'm also a solicitor. Uh, we have muted everyone's phone, but please feel free to send in questions. You can type in questions in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen, and I propose to take any questions at the end of the webinar, which is scheduled to last about an hour. Now, you'll see up on screen uh, a short disclaimer, which I shall read to you. Whilst we make reasonable efforts to ensure our content is accurate and up-to-date, information and guidance in this webinar does not and is not intended to amount to legal advice in any particular case. Uh, no responsibility for any consequence of relying upon the webinar material or presentations of the webinar is assumed by lease or any of our advisors. Um, it's got up there, the law is stated as of 11th of October 2016. That's when I drafted these slides, but rest assured, none of the law has changed since uh, I drafted those slides 11th of October until today. Um, and that is our topic for today. So introductory level, lease extension, lease extension of flats. If you're expecting lease extension of houses, you're going to be sorely disappointed. We're covering lease extension of flats as advertised, and it's part one uh, of a series of two webinars. I'll be mentioning the second part, which I myself will be conducting uh, uh, in the closing slide at the end of this webinar today. Um, so, it's going to be an introductory level, the sort of brief overview, really, within the hour available uh, about uh, lease extension of flats. Part two, um, we'll be covering more topics. So, what are we going to cover uh, in the ensuing hour? Well, what we're going to cover is voluntary, or outside the act, as we could call them, and uh, statutory uh, extensions. Uh, statutory lease extensions we'll cover in detail. Uh, we'll also cover the qualification criteria and also basic initial investigations made at the outset before embarking upon the uh, lease extension process. We'll also cover drafting the initial notice. That's the opening shot in a statutory lease extension. We'll be covering that, uh, what the basic ingredients of the initial notice, which is a, a colloquially called in the profession uh, a Section 42 notice. Anyway, that's the topics we'll be covering in the next hour. So what can I say about a lease extension? Why is it necessary to consider it? And what entitlements does a leasehold owner of flats have to an extension of the lease term? We're not talking about a physical extension, building outwards, maybe adding a conservatory or a lean-to, or a building on the roof for a top floor flat, or in a building loft extension. We're not talking about a physical extension. We're talking about the extension of the term. So if it's got uh, 99 years left to go, uh, or, well, say 75 years left to go, we're talking about extending the term to make it much longer. Why would one want to extend the term of the lease? Well, basically, a lease itself is what we'd call a wasting asset. Unlike having a freehold, it's going to be houses, really, although there are still leasehold houses. Uh, it, unlike having a freehold, we have an everlasting interest in land, the interest in a lease is time limited. And as the years go by, it's worth less and less and less and less attractive to uh, mortgage lenders, lenders um, advancing loans secured on uh, property, uh, flats in these cases, leasehold flats. So um, it might be acceptable to a lender and usually is for 95 years, uh, a lease or a lease granted at the outset for 99 years, or right to buy a lease, which is 125 years. Uh, but it, when it comes up to 75, 70 years, they may well get cold feet. Um, 
as a rule of thumb, my experience is that the, the, the um, established residential uh, lenders like to see 35 years uh, left at the end of the standard uh, residential mortgage. So standard residential mortgage is 25 years, so 35 plus 25 equals 60 years. So uh, below 60, I'd, I'd say, cash buyers. But lenders vary on the number of years they regard as acceptable. You can look in some of the trade magazines uh, for uh, about mortgages or getting mortgages. They may tell you, but you can also look at the Council of Mortgage Lenders, Lenders Handbook, online uh, the drop down and of, often they will spell out uh, in their standing instructions what the uh, lenders who are CML members uh, regard as an acceptable number of years but lease extension one wants to make it more mortgageable more marketable more sellable and more transferable transferable by extending the term of the lease uh, particularly if it's at a point where there's less than attractive to uh, lending institutions. So it should, uh, in addition, in addition to make it more marketable and marketable, it should, it should add value to the leaseholder's property, um, increase the value from what it is. And it's also an opportunity to uh, amend the lease. It may well be several years old. It may well uh, predate and uh, fall foul of uh, what is required of uh, the conditions in the Council of Mortgage Lenders Handbook. There may be also other amendments to the lease that might be want to be put in as well, uh, perhaps to do with subletting or alterations or pets or whatever, either side uh, wanting amendments. To a certain extent, if one goes down the statutory route, amendments can be made to the lease, and that's something that we'll be covering in part two uh, of these webinars. So as I indicated at the outset, essentially there are two ways to approach getting a lease extension for a flat. There's a non-statutory or voluntary lease extension and the statutory lease extension under the Leasehold Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993, which got royal assent of Parliament uh, on the 1st of November 1993 and was a major piece of legislation of residential leasehold at the time. So non-statutory voluntary lease extension, it's doing a deal, and we often call them uh, a lease extension outside the Act, being outside the 1993 Act. So I, I, I think anybody who comes to us, if they haven't done so already, um, or who comes to us seeking advice about getting a 1993 Act extension, we'd say, and I think any professional uh, worth their salt uh, would say, have you considered non-statutory lease extension first? There are pros and cons, which we'll come on to shortly, uh, but um, certainly the landlord should be advised um, uh, to get an undertaking for their costs, whether or not a lease extension is granted if you're acting for the landlord or competent landlord or freeholder. And likewise, the leaseholder's solicitor should think carefully about uh, the nature of the undertaking given in a voluntary lease extension and if it involves the commitment of any money, getting the money from the client first. Um, with a voluntary lease extension, it may well take place as a, as a deed of variation to the original lease. Um, now, as it's extending the term of the lease, it will operate as a surrender and regrant. As I understand it, it'll be the closure of the title, the leasehold title at the land registry and the um, registering of a new one. Uh, most likely the consent of the uh, flat owners, the leasehold lender will be required if, if what, there is a lender and usually by way of a deed of substituted security for which they may charge. And uh, anybody acting for a leaseholder and trying to do a deal uh, should be advised of uh, any potential fee uh, to their client for a deed of substituted security. I'm going to pass over briefly the, the potential pros and cons um, of a stat non statutory uh, lease extension, a deal done outside the 93 Act. Theoretically, it's not adversarial uh, because it's done by uh, agreement, and uh, one would expect that 
his solicitors are engaged, there'll be less legal work required, and they'll, it might well be that the, the deal's done between the parties or their respective surveyors, with the solicitors just being instructed to do the legal work, draft leases and travelling drafts, etc., and then the ultimate engrossments. Uh, there may be an ultimate saving on legal costs, and um, there might be uh, being able to um, an early deal, particularly if the freeholder is, is anxious for their money, they might be able to get a reduction on, on the premium, and time may be saved. Some situations that these pros might not be, not arise, but these are the potential advantages of a non-statutory lease extension. There are potential drawbacks in any situation. There are. Um, it's gentlemen's negotiation. Neither party can be forced to agree a lease extension. Um, the terms might not offer good value. Um, I would expect somebody who, particularly if it's a, a lot of money, is, is involved to take valuation advice uh, on a lease extension outside the Act. There isn't a court or tribunal or arbitrator or judge or referee who can decide any outstanding issues, be it the price or terms of the new lease, uh, if agreement cannot be reached in a voluntary lease extension. And... Uh, Capital gains tax rollover relief, uh, I understand, is not available to the landlord in a, in a non-statutory lease extension. So what is a statutory lease extension, which is really the guts of uh, our webinar today? Well, um, it stems from the 1993 Act, which... Uh, in our presentation today, I refer to uh, as the Act from now on, and it's located in Chapter 2 of Part 1 of the 93 Act and certain schedules or schedules to the Act. There was also a statutory instrument uh, dealing with some of the conveyancing aspects, uh, the Leasehold Reform Collective Enfranchisement and Lease Renewal Regulations 1993, which where it arises from now on uh, in this webinar and part two webinar um, coming up in early November, I shall refer to as the 1993 regulations. Um, the uh, legislation in 2002, uh, Common Holding Leasehold Reform Act, Chapter 3 of Part 2, made certain amendments to um, qualification criteria for a lease extension and um, also some of the valuation uh, principles. Likewise, what you should know is, is that where the price and terms of the lease uh, under a 1993 Act extension are contested, um, then one goes to a body called the Tribunal Procedure, First Tier Tribunal, Property Chambers Rules, uh, and um, that, that is covered by the Rules 2013. That is the uh, tri body in England. Uh, there's five of them in the country, uh, including one in London. Uh, in Wales, it's uh, another body entirely. It's a body that existed uh, before the 1st of July 2013 in England, but it's still the Leasehold Valuation Tribunal in Wales with different procedural regulations under uh, Leasehold Valuation Tribunal, Tribunal's Procedure Wales Regulations 2004. So I jumped a couple of slides there, and I'll take you to the next slide. So what does the 1993 Act give the interested leaseholder interested in extending the lease of their flat? Well, in 1993, the primary rights that are given are that the exchange for a premium, or paying a price, because it doesn't come for free, is to extend the lease by adding an additional 90 years to the existing term and essentially to remove the obligation to pay a ground rent. Basically, it would be an obligation, if it could be called an obligation, to pay a peppercorn rent instead. So, 
if there is, say, 75 years left to go, what you get under the 93 Act as a leaseholder of a flat is 90 plus 75 years. That's 165 years, a brand new lease of 165 years uh, in substitution for the existing lease uh, of uh, 75 years. And moreover, throughout that term of 165 uh, years, it's a peppercorn rent, nil rent that has to be paid. Well, in order to go down the statutory route and to invoke the rights available under the 1993 Act, the leaseholder stroke flat owner must qualify and I'll come on to the qualification criteria shortly, and follow the procedure set out in the Act. Um, today's webinar will cover drafting the Section 42 notice, succeeding webinar, the Part 2 will cover the rest. So we start off uh, at the beginning on a 1993 Act extension. If a solicitor is engaged, or it might be a surveyor who's doing it uh, with sufficient runoff insurance cover, but if a solicitor is engaged, then they will check that their client as the leaseholder qualifies and do the appropriate due diligence, which may just be um, checking land registry entries if it's registered title as most property is. Um, they will also, uh, although it's not obligatory uh, to do so, either the leaseholder does so or via their solicitor, obtain a uh, valuation uh, of the premium. As I said, it's not obligatory to do so, but it's prudent to do so, particularly if there's a large sum of money involved. <coughs> Further down the 1993 Act process, uh, if a solicitor is engaged, they'll draft the starting gun, the leaseholder's notice, the Section 42 notice, and serve it on uh, an individual or entity called uh, the competent landlord, and I'll come on to what that means shortly, and any third party to the lease. Service of the Section 42 notice will be dealt with in the subsequent webinar, but third party to the lease for your should realise is, say, any management company uh, that's a party to the lease, uh, and um, I suppose any guarantor if they're, they're a, a party to the lease, although one doesn't find that many guarantors uh, for residential leases, they tend to be commercial leases. That Section 42 notice has certain important information in it, uh, and one of the most important bits of information is the deadline for the landlord to serve a counter notice. That deadline given to the landlord, the competent landlord, must be at least two months to respond with a counter notice. Continuing, uh, what would happen is that um, the landlord, the competent landlord, or their solicitors, will scrutinise the validity of the notice. They may take certain technical points, uh, either about the um, drafting of the notice, the serving of the notice, whether or not the leaseholder qualifies, um, and uh, they might serve a negative counter notice, something that we will dwell upon in uh, the subsequent part two webinar, uh, in which case if they serve a negative counter notice, uh, if a deal isn't done or settled in any way, then the county court has jurisdiction to deal with uh, issues of um, eligibility. Um, otherwise, it may well be that they'll uh, serve a positive counter notice but may just uh, dispute the price. They might concede the uh, eligibility for a lease extension and validity of the Section 42 notice and serve a counter offer or a counter notice with a counter offer. What would they base their counter offer on? Well, uh, the landlord's valuer uh, has an entitlement uh, to go into the flat, giving certain days notice, and to carry out a valuation of the flat, uh, with usually the fees of the valuer uh, for doing so being ultimately paid by the leaseholder seeking the lease extension. <coughs> 
So uh, the, the landlord's valuer, if one is engaged and carries out evaluation of the flat, will report to the landlord, and on the strength of their valuation, and maybe considering our recommendations of the valuer, they would then serve a counter notice uh, on the leaseholder. That would be a positive counter notice, uh, admitting the right to a lease extension, but with a uh, counter offer, which might also include counter offer uh, on the terms of the new lease being proposed. Now, uh, if it's, uh, let's assume for the rest of uh, this short depiction of the lease extension process that the uh, competent landlord doesn't take issue with the claim and serves a positive counter notice, there's a two month period for negotiation. Most likely, if the valuer is engaged, negotiation going on between respective valuers. And um, if they can do a deal during that period, then well and good, shake hands, move to drafting the lease. However, after the initial two month period ends and there hasn't been a settlement, an overall settlement, uh, then one can go the leaseholder or either side, but usually the leaseholder will apply unless the landlord wants their money early. Uh, either side can apply to the appropriate tribunal, the first tier tribunal property chamber in England and the leasehold valuation tribunal in Wales to determine any issues in dispute. Now that's important, it's only any issues in dispute that the tribunal can determine, not anything that's been agreed. And um, it's each party pays their, their own costs at the tribunal, uh, save in certain exceptional circumstances. Well, if the parties agree the terms of the new lease, uh, including the price, or the tribunal makes a determination uh, including uh, the price. Once everything's been decided either by agreement or by tribunal determination, then there's, um, a, a, if it's the tribunal, it's a period for appealing, and then uh, if it's uh, uh, agreement, it's from the date of agreement, there is then another two months to complete, to enter into a binding lease. Now, if no completion uh, takes place within that two month period, and it's called the appropriate period, either party can apply to the county court local to where the flat is for such order as the court thinks fit. And it's with the leaseholder, they'll apply for what's colloquially called a vesting order, an order compelling the competent landlord to complete the lease extension. I'm not going to do a lot upon it in this webinar today, but the deadlines and the timetable are crucial because those who practice in the field regularly or even not regularly should appreciate and know that there are serious sanctions if the timetable is not completed and adhered to. Uh, serious sanctions uh, if the deadline is missed namely Dean Woodrow and um, can't serve another uh, Section 42 notice for 12 months and certain abortive professional fees of the competent landlord. Perhaps any other relevant landlords will have to be paid. I shall come on to the issue of uh, deemed withdrawal and express withdrawal and uh, uh, costs recoverable by the competent landlord and others in the part two webinar. So what are the qualification criteria? Well, it's located in section 39 of the 1993 Act. Um, the leaseholder has to be a qualifying tenant of the flat and has been so for the last two years at the date the uh, initial notice, the section 42 notice is given. So that raises three questions. And those three questions are depicted on the slide in front of us. And, those, and it is basically, 
is the leaseholder a qualifying tenant? Are they the leaseholder of a flat? And have they owned it for at least two years? And we shall come on to look and investigate those three questions now. What's a qualifying tenant? Well, one looks at section five of the 1993 Act. And it's somebody, someone uh, who, or an entity, might be a company, corporate leaseholder, who has a long lease. And a long lease is defined in section seven of the 1993 Act as essentially on a lease originally granted for a term exceeding 21 years. So it might be 99 years when it was granted, 125 years when it was granted uh, under a, um, say, a right to buy lease as, as, as they are. But they've got to be for over 21 years when they were originally granted. There are some other leases which one rarely, and I rarely come across them, which also qualifies as long leases, uh, which may be under uh, a term exceeding 21 years. Uh, and that can include uh, uh, one where the term is fixed by law. Uh, uh, it's a grant with a covenant or obligation on the part of the landlord to perpetually renew it. There is some controversy about shared ownership leases and where the leaseholder owns less than 100% of the equity. And I'll explain briefly the controversy. And um, when one was originally considered the definition in the Act, it looks as if it says, if they haven't staircased to 100%, they're not a qualifying tenant, they're not a long lease, they can't be a qualifying tenant, they can't go for a lease extension. Shared ownerships tend to be in housing associations or registered providers. But there was a case about right, right to manage, which has very similar definition of a long lease and qualifying tenant for eligibility to take part in right to manage. And that case said, and it was a case called Corscom, C-O-R-S-C-O-M-B-E -E against Roseleb, R-O-S-E-L-E-B, Limited, in the Upper Tribunal Lands Chamber, that so long as it was for over 21 years, it was a long lease, the shared ownership lease, even if that hadn't staircased to 100%. So the read across from that to uh, a qualifying tenant for a lease extension, or indeed a qualifying tenant to participate uh, in a collective enfranchisement, is that they could well be a qualifying tenant even if they haven't staircased to 100%. It's arguable, but I draw your attention the right to manage case Corsicum and Roseleb. Now, there's no qualifying tenant where it's a business lease uh, as defined under Part 2 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. Another instance is where the immediate landlord is a charitable housing trust, uh, being a charity within the meaning of the Charities Act 1993. And the flat forms part of the accommodation provided in pursuit of its charitable purposes. So if it's a long lease, say, held for investment purposes by the, uh, sort of the reversion to a long lease, held for investment purposes by the charity, uh, it may not, well not fall within the exemption. And finally, there's a final one, which I've rarely come across, where it's an unlawful sublease or underlease. So if it was granted out of a lease that was not a long lease, and the grant was made in breach of the superior lease, and there has been no waiver of the breach by the superior landlord, it would usually be the freeholder. Now, those who deal with collective enfranchisement uh, will know that if a person owns more than three flats on long leases, they can't be a qualifying tenant of any of them, three flats or more. Two flats, they can be qualifying tenants of either of them. Likewise, it, it applies to associated companies. So I call it the three flats and your out rule. Uh, however, that doesn't apply to lease extensions. You could have as many flats and not as qualifying tenants in the building, uh, and um, three or more, and you can uh, subject to the other qualification criteria being met, you can go for lease extensions on any or all of them.
two years ownership is crucial. There used to be a residence requirement, and it was in the 1993 Leaseholder Form Housing and Urban Development Act. That residence requirement was abolished in the 2002 uh, Common Hold Leasehold Reform Act as from 26th of June um, 2002. And what it says now is two years ownership. So long as the flat owner, the leaseholder, has been a qualified tenant of their flat for at least three years, for at least two years, sorry, for at least two years, then they can go for a statutory lease extension. They can own for less than two years, of course, and try to do a deal with the landlord, but they can't go down the 93 Act route and force the landlord, subject to following the procedure, to grant a statutory lease extension unless they've been the owner for two years. Now, how does one work out when two years runs? <coughs> well, it's usually calculated from the date that um, the uh, owner of the flat, having bought the flat, is registered as such as the registered proprietor at the land registry. There might be a period of a month or so from the, the date of completion to the date of registration, but it runs really from them. Although it's, if it's a grant of new lease, say, and there's an agreement for a lease, one can include the period prior to registration where the leaseholder has entered into an agreement for lease. And that's section 101 brackets, two brackets of the 93 Act. And it must be a continuous period of two years. Also introduced by the 2002 Common Hold Leasehold Reform Act was an entitlement for personal representatives, be they executors under a grant of probate or administrators under a letters of administration. Uh, of a deceased qualifying tenant to um, start the ball rolling with a statutory lease extension and serve the Section 42 notice. They can do that in their capacity as executors or administrators, personal representatives. What are the criteria for that? Well, first, the qualifying tenant who had passed away should have been uh, the qualifying tenant, uh, should have owned for two years at least, as of the, the day they passed away. And um, the Section 42 notice must be served by the executors, stroke administrators, within a two years window, starting from the date probate is granted or from the date of letters of administration. There's a definition of the flat. You can make various definitions of flats in different legislation, but for the purposes of the 93 Act, there's a definition of the flat. It means a separate set of premises, whether or not on the same floor, this could be a duplex, which forms part of a building, constructed or adapted for use for the purposes of a dwelling, and either the whole or material part of which lies above or below some other part of the building. Now, dwelling, the, the word featuring in that definition, means a building or part of a building, part of a building for a flat, occupied or intended to be occupied as a separate dwelling. Um, and so that calls into question things like um, uh, serviced accommodation. There has been some case law uh, about live use units. My recollection is it was a county court level um, and said it turns on its own facts, but in the particular case I'm thinking of, um, it was Bishopsgate Foundation against Curtis about a flat in Nile Street in, in Islington. Uh, they said that that particular case they, they were, um, did fall within the definition. Uh, of a dwelling stroke flat for le le statutory lease extension purposes, but turns on its own facts. And Bishopsgate Foundation and Curtis, which was about 10 years ago, was county court case. So it's sort of persuaded, but it, it's not binding law. What's interesting about, uh, particularly interesting about the meaning of the word flat, 
uh, in the 93 Act for the purposes of a lease extension is that by virtue of section 62 brackets, two brackets of the 93 Act, the, mean, the word flat includes any garage, any outhouse, any garden, any yard, and appurtenances which belong to or usually enjoyed with the flat and on the relevant date, and that's the date where the Section 42 notice is given to the competent landlord, on the relevant date is let to the qualifying tenant with the flat. So it's got to have all those ingredients in to be captured on a lease extension, any outhouse, garden, yard, appurtenances and garage. What does appurtenance mean? Well, to be an appurtenance of the flat, going back, it's got to belong to or be usually enjoyed with a flat, contained within the premises of which the flat forms part, or be situated within the curtilage of those premises. That's an interesting one, the curtilage of those premises, because it's easier to work out what the curtilage of premises are if it's a leasehold house, but less so when it's a ground floor flat. But I envisage it means things like a parking space outside the building, but within its curtilage. Now, there might be separate leases uh, of, of the flat, and of uh, a pertinent property, separate lease of a flat, separate lease of a garage. They can be read together as one single lease, so long as they have the same landlord and the same tenant. And uh, before I pass on from pertinent property, I think the leading case is Cadogan against McGurk um, from um, the late 90s, uh, which said that uh, a storeroom on the sixth floor of a block of flats, which was not included in the lease of a second floor flat within that block of flats, uh, and with the storeroom being let under a separate lease, but same landlord, same tenant, as with the flat, that storeroom would not be regarded as an outhouse, as it was not outside the building, but it could be regarded as an appurtenance as it was within the curtilage of the block. That's probably the first main case on a pertinent property for lease extensions. Now, I've mentioned about earlier when I'm going through the procedure about who the Section 42 notice, the initial notice, is served on. And I mentioned the concept of the competent landlord. Well, it's on the competent landlord that the Section 42 notice is served. So at the outset, one has to identify who is the competent landlord. It may well be that that's not a great issue if it's just a normal landlord and tenant relationship. It might be more complex where there's a tiered title structure. Now, the important thing is the competent landlord acts for all the other landlords. Uh, and the premium, the price, uh, for the lease extension is payable to that competent landlord or their legal representatives, and that competent landlord then accounts to other landlords who might be head leases or might be co-freeholders, uh, but usually it might be head leases, might be a sub-underlease, sub-sub-underleases, head leases in between. And that competent landlord acts for all the others unless a notice of independent representation is served by the uh, intermediate landlord, in which case they can act separately and the competent landlord wouldn't be acting on their behalf. Although there's a case going up to the Court of Appeal uh, or has been heard in the Court of Appeal, and we're waiting for a judgment shortly about whether they can do a deal on the price, even though the competent landlord can do a deal on the price uh, with the leasehold, even though a notice of independent representation is served. When we get the judgment, do look on the lease website and elsewhere on our website because uh, we'll fully report on it. So who is the competent landlord? The competent landlord is the person or entity who has an interest of sufficient duration to grant the lease extension. And that definition can be found in section 40 of the Act 
So if it's a freeholder, a head landlord, intermediate landlord, and an underlease, underland, under lessee, then it's usually going to be the freeholder uh, because the under lessee may just have an under lease. Well, the head lease may just be three more days, uh, three days or so more, a little bit more, a fag end more than the period left to go on the under lease. However, the landlord, uh, if he's got a really long lease, the, the head landlord, the intermediate landlord, they've got a really, really long lease, then it may well be that they've got the ability to grant a lease extension. Um, so say the under lessee's got 75 years left to go on their lease, 90 years statutory lease extension, 165 years they're entitled to. If the intermediate landlord has a lease of sufficient duration that's much longer than 165 years left to go, they will be the competent landlord. Otherwise, the competent landlord will be the freeholder. So identify first if it's uh, debatable, uh, or if it's tiered title structure with head landlord, maybe several under leases, whatever, who is the competent landlord upon whom the Section 42 notice, the original one, is served. If it's a tiered title structure, uh, then the competent landlord is identified and served the Section 42 notice. And as I said earlier, they're empowered to conduct proceedings on behalf of the other landlords. And those other, uh, those who are not competent landlords but have uh, interests in the property, um, head leasehold interests, whatever, they are called other landlords. So that's how they're termed in the registration. So you've got competent landlord on whom the Section 42 notice is served and other landlords who get a copy of the Section 42 notice. And the final straight of our webinar today, we're going to take you through the drafting of the Section 42 notice. I'm not going to take you through it in detail. But I'm going to tell you what the basic contents are and give you a bit, a few pointers. And the pointers are this. It's absolutely vital to get the contents right. There are saving provisions in the legislation for errors but don't rely on those and get it right anyway and try and avoid uh, any arguments with the uh, competent landlord or their solicitors and get it right anyway. And, and if it's because if you serve an incorrect one and have to serve another one, um, then it may well be that you have lost a crucial 80 year point because uh, when it dips below 80 years, there's marriage value to pay, but it's okay. Marriage value is nil on the purchase price while there's over 80 years left to go. And that period for calculating marriage value is as at the date of service of the Section 42 notice. Get the signatures right. That's less of an issue uh, thanks to the abolition of the need for personal signatures on the Section 42 notice. But even then, I think it's a good idea to get the um, original leaseholder's signature unless logistically or for some reason uh, that can't be obtained. And even then, if you're an agent, attorney, solicitor signing on behalf of the leaseholder, get their specific authority to do so. It should be served in the right way and served on the right people. That's crucial as well. Service of the Section 42 notice we're going to cover in the next webinar. So I'll keep you in suspense about that. But do get your diary active, backup diaries, etc., and particularly diarise these deadlines. Otherwise, the Deed Withdrawal Acts will fall down. Um, the deadline for serving a counter notice, uh, that's particularly important for the landlord. Um, the deadline for applying to the appropriate tribunal, and the deadline for applying to the county court. As part of the basic legwork, uh, then um, it should be, the initial notice should be registered uh, against the freehold title and any other relevant titles, titles of the other landlords, the intermediate landlords. If the freehold title is registered, it's at HM Land Registry, or now called the Land Registry, and, uh, with a unilateral notice, 
in the proprietorship register. Otherwise, down in Plymouth, if it's unregistered land, the freehold title, at the land charges registry. And the effect is of, sorry, jump the slides there. The effect of registration is it binds, the section 42 notice binds a successor entitled to the freehold. If it's not registered, uh, the section 42 notice, once it's been served and the freehold or changes hands, it's not binding on the successor entitled. Uh, and it's not a deemed withdrawal of the section 42 notice, but it's rendered void. Another notice can be served within 12 months, but you don't want to be in that situation because when it was served, the section 42 notice, it might have been on the cusp of the 80 years. So the contents of the initial notice are specified in section 42 of the 1993 Act. There is no prescribed form. Now, if you do any housing franchisements, you'll be aware that there is a prescribed form laid down by statutory instrument, but there isn't for the section 42 notice. Uh, perhaps it's all part of the deregulation, but um, there are forms, precedents available, textbooks from legal stationers, but um, as I put in bold on that slide, precedents are slaves and not masters. Therefore, you should make sure that the Section 42 notice that you draft and you serve, if you're the leaseholder or their solicitors, um, matches the requirements of Section 42 of the 93 Act. And uh, if you're in a legal office or wherever, it's a good idea after drafting it to double or, trek it, double or treble check it with um, colleagues also doing this sort of work uh, before it's committed to the postal service. Now, the initial contents, they, it should specify the name of the leaseholder and check the land registry entries so it matches. Uh, put in their full name, including the middle names, and if there are joint leaseholders, um, put in all their names as well. Make sure that joint leaseholders are all named in the section 42 notice as leaseholders. Get that basic information right. Also, make sure that you, I think that's pretty crucial, specify the address of the flat for which the lease extension is claimed. Make sure you get in the full address so that the recipient of the notice is left in no doubt what you're claiming and maybe refer to the land registry title number. Um, Full postcode, uh, the street name and the street number, um, the number of the flat, um, and the name of the block, if those are all ingredients in the address. And of course, the postal code. Then, uh, Section 42 notice requires that particulars of the flat are given sufficient to identify it as being the subject of the lease extension claim. Now, those who practice with collective enfranchisement of flats uh, will be aware that it's mandatory to have a flat, sorry, a plan uh, attached to the initial notice in a collective enfranchisement. That's not so with Section 42 lease extension notices. It's not obligatory to attach a plan, but I think it's prudent to do so, particularly, say, The initial notice should also uh, give particulars of the lease, again, uh, as with giving particulars of the property sufficient uh, to identify as 
being the subject of the lease extension. And at the very least, it should include the date it was granted, the term for which it was granted, and the date of commencement of the term. You don't have to put in the original parties to the lease, but why not? It's sufficient to identify it. If uh, there is separate, if a pertinent property garage if it was a purchase from an uh, existing flat owner, or when the transfer to the flat owner was registered at the land registry. I don't think anything is lost by putting that information in the Section 42 notice, but Section 42 of the Act doesn't oblige you to put that information in. Now, what's proved controversial at the courts is um, the next ingredient content for initial notice. That is the premium the leaseholder proposes to pay. Now, if it's just a competent landlord, landlord tenant, great, just put that in. However, if they're intermediate interests or other landlords, you've got to put a price in for them, even if it's insignificant. You, you, you cannot just put in none or not applicable. Um, You've got to put in a separate price earmarked, even though the, the money goes in the first place to the competent landlord, um, you've got to put a figure in. I can't stress that too highly, otherwise uh, for the intermediate interest, the head landlords, uh, because otherwise it invalidates the notice. This is where it's got controversial over the years. The price proposed must be offered in good faith and a general, genuine proposal, not a nominal figure. And we go back to the case in the Court of Appeal in 1999, Cadogan against Morris, where a derisory figure, I think it was £100, was put in, which was clearly not the figure that they proposed to pay. And the court said it's not given in good faith, it's not bona fide, uh, and therefore it renders the notice invalid because you've got to put in the price you propose to pay and that wasn't the price that ultimately they proposed to pay. So it rendered the notice invalid. The latest and last case <coughs> was about Dolphin Square, large block in Pimlico, I think the largest one in Europe. It was a huge enfranchisement case with several principles involved that went to the High Court. Uh, Westbrook Dolphin Square Limited against French Life Limited 2014 EWHC 2433. And what um, I call it the Dolphin Square case, set, case said is the price proposed must be a genuine opening offer. It doesn't have to fall within the range of reasonably justifiable valuations. Um, the lessee doesn't have to believe that it would be accepted, uh, but it has to be bona fide. Now, this opens a can of worms as to whether or not it's a genuine opening offer. Um, it, it's got to be at least bona fide. So if it's not bona fide, if it's a derisory amount, it, it, it's not going to meet that test. But otherwise, it, it could be above, it could be bona fide, but it might, you know, how does one construe it's a genuine opening offer? Uh, particularly if the court's not being asked to look at um, valuation evidence. Anyway, that controversy about that uh, rumbles on. It's best, certainly, when you put the price in the Section 42 notice to, um, if you've engaged a valuer uh, as a leaseholder, uh, to rely on the valuer's advice. The initial notice should also specify the terms which the leaseholder proposed should be contained in the new lease. Uh, to a certain extent, the lease can be uh, varied uh, to uh, exclude or uh, modify terms that are in the existing lease. Uh, in, in the next webinar, we'll come on to that, uh, what terms in the new lease uh, could be achieved on the statutory lease extension. It should also specify uh, the, the uh, name and address of the person, if any, appointed by the leaseholder to act for them in connection with the claim, usually a solicitor or surveyor. 
uh, unless they're acting for themselves, the leaseholder, and an address in England at Wales, so it's not Scotland or Northern Ireland, uh, which notices may be given to such a person. And it should specify the date for the counter notice. As I indicated earlier, it shouldn't be should be not less than two months after the date the initial notice is given. Um, add on some extra days to two months deadline. I was discussing this with some solicitors yesterday, practicing regularly in the enfranchisement field. One firm said they added on an extra ten days to the two months deadline. Another one said um, they added on two weeks as a matter of course. You can't be faulted adding on too much as the deadline. Don't make it the same date as the deadline. Do take advice, do take into consideration um, delays in the post. Do take into consideration, as I'll explain in the next webinar, that, and as I indicated earlier, that the um, Section 42 notice also has to be served on third parties, like management companies in a tripartite lease. So al allow for that in service. The notice isn't treated as being properly given until all the parties, including 13, all the third parties, have been properly served. If there are other landlords, like um, intermediate landlords, uh, the initial notice being served on the competent landlord, then the initial notice should say that copies are being given to those other landlords, stating uh, who they are. And now, as we reach the end, I'm going to say a little bit about the signature of the initial notice, as I said a little bit earlier. The law changed in England on the 13th of May 2014, and for leasehold flats in Wales, 1st December 2014. But I think I'll tell you a little bit about the old law. If there was more than one leaseholder, both would have to sign, and only personal signatures would suffice, however elderly or infirm they may be. A signature by a solicitor or an agent or a relative wasn't valid. And this was all because of an interpretation of Section 99 5A of the 93 Act uh, in a case called St. Ermin's Property Company against Tingay, the Court of Appeal, where uh, somebody being the uh, donee of a, a power of attorney uh, and, and signing a Section 42 notice as such was held uh, that their signature uh, was not enough. Uh, not the the fact it was under attorney, because it had to be the personal signature of the leaseholder concerned. And therefore, in St. Irwin's Property Company against Tingay, the notice was rendered invalid. Corporate leaseholders once had to check the company's constitution, but um, a case called Hillmay and 20 Pembridge Villas dealt with the requirements of Section 44 Capital A of the Companies Act 2006 and set out as depicted on that slide, which would be the various legitimate ways for a company to sign uh, a Section 42 notice. But it was all changed by the Leaseholder Reform Amendment Act 2014 for properties in England, which amended Section 99 5A of the Act. Uh, that Act got royal assent on the 13th of March 2014 and uh, came into force, was implemented on the 13th of May 2014. Uh, a month later, and applied to all Section 42 notices served on or after 13th of May 2014. And for Wales, that's the legislation. Uh, it, it was tacked on to the Housing Wales Act 2014, and there's the details of the commencement order, the statute instrument. There, it was for all Section 42 notices served on or after the 1st of December 2014. So what are the new rules? Well, certainly make life easier when it comes to section, signing Section 42 notices. There's no need for them to be signed by or on behalf of each leaseholder. So there's no need, uh, so that they, they, sorry, there's no need anymore for a personal signature. They can now be signed by on behalf of each leaseholder, including by a solicitor attorney, agent, 
on the leaseholder's behalf. But it's important to ensure that there's been proper authority given by the leaseholders to the person who is ultimately going to sign the Section 42 notice on their behalf. And finally, inaccuracies. As I said earlier, do get it right. There are some saving provisions. Um, it's not invalidated by any inaccuracy in any of the particulars required by Section 42. Um, particulars really means the details of the lease. So if you get some of the details of the lease wrong, but, but as long as it's not completely misleading, then it may well be saved. Um, also by any misdescription of the property. But again, as long as it's not completely uh, misleading. But get the notice drafted correctly anyway to avoid any argument and particularly get the notice drafted and properly served um, if one is on the cusp of the section of the of the 80 year period. And now on to questions. And uh, I've got some questions. Let's have a look. Does the counter notice to the section 42 notice need to be in a particular statutory format or can it be by letter stroke email? Well, I have to say I haven't drafted the slides yet for the next webinar, but I'll probably be covering this issue, but I'm happy to answer it now. There is not a statutory format um, for the section 45 counter notice, just as uh, there isn't uh, for Section 42 notices, but there are for 67 Act notices. So there isn't a particular format uh, laid down by statutory instrument by Parliament for the Section 42 Act uh, notice and sorry, Section 45 notice and contents. Um, it should follow um, the requirements of Section 45, certainly. And then you say, can it be by letter or email? interesting one about email. Um, there were a couple of cases, I think they were last year, and they were both at the county court, so they're not higher authority, but they're interesting. Uh, and one, I think one that might be appealing, appeal. perhaps someone could let me know. There was one case that said that, um, I think it was a Section 13 notice, so by extension a Section 42 notice, could be served by email. But there was another case saying that a Section 21 notice, that, that was the equivalent to collective enfranchisement, um, that's a, a counter notice, it couldn't be served by email or, or, uh, or by fax. There is a, a case as well, a uh, county court level saying a Section 42 notice can't be served by fax. So uh, according to these county court cases, one to read across from section 32 no, 13 notices to section 42 notices, a section 42 one could be served by email, but not a, a, a section 45 one. Right. Next question. If all matters agreed, but other landlord solicitors dragging their feet, should an ap application uh, still be made to take lessee's interest or an agreement in writing, even? E enough, even after the six months period. Well, um, get the application in within the six months period. I take it we're talking six months, the two months for negotiating a settlement, and another four months to apply to the tribunal uh, to decide terms that haven't been agreed. Get the application in uh, within that four months period, following the two months for, for settling. If you don't get it in within that four months period, um, then deemed withdrawal, so get the application in just to protect uh, the leaseholder's position. Um, one's not committed to a hearing, one can still go on trying to settle and hopefully uh, can settle without the costs accelerating by preparing for a tribunal. Uh, but yeah, get the protective application in. There's um, a form one can download from the tribunal's website, it's also on our website of course, and uh, the, the tribunal application form recently amended. Why was it recently amended? Um, because for the first time fees were brought in for uh, 93 Act applications to the tribunal, including uh, lease extensions for flats. So it's £100 application fee, I think it's from the end of July, and £200 hearing fee if it goes to a hearing. Uh, and the, the um, 
application forms were changed to uh, take on board take the, um, the new fees regime. But get the application in just to protect your client's position. What is, uh, what is the position with the executive of the state who fails to serve a notice within two years of the grant of probate? Do they then qualify as an ex owner after two years since the date of death? It's an interesting one. I think I've seen some commentary on, on, on that somewhere in, in one of our textbooks. Perhaps if, you can come back to me uh, offline and, and we can discuss it. You'll drop me a line. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting point um, about whether they're an owner. They can then qualify. I, I mean, the fact of the matter is that usually, my experience is that um, executives don't usually get registered the land registry as the owner, although by automatic transition, transmission, they get the title via the grant of probate. And I wonder if that makes a difference if they're not registered. Anyway, happy to discuss that one offline if you'd like to get in touch with me. Now, another question. If you fail to start negotiations within the two months period from the receipt of the counter notice, can the landlord refuse to negotiate with you after the two months period, initial two months period? If so, can you st still take it to the tribunal to make a determination on the price as it now falls within the four month period? E.g., counter notice served 1st of August by 8th of October, tenant only just received back his valuation advice. Can the valuer now go negotiate with the landlord or not as the initial two months has passed? If no, can the tenant apply to tribunal to determine the price? Um, well, the short answer is just get the application in um, to the tribunal if, if the two months period has passed, but one is in within the four months period. One can't force either side to negotiate, but I uh, I mean, hopefully they will, but you can't force either side to negotiate. Um, but with, um, hopefully they'll be more amenable to negotiating once the application's gone in and there are timetables and things uh, laid down by the tribunal to do X, Y, Z, produce experts, report, exchange, draft, lease documentation. Um, but yeah, as with a previous uh, question, just, just get the application in if you're in the, the four months period just to protect your client. I mean, you can leave it to the, to the last minute, but I wouldn't do so. Right. Other, other questions? Um, let's have a look. Um, All oh, right, I've got a client, they're a husband and wife, and um, they're holding as, they, were held, they were holding as joint tenants of property. Um, they've now transferred from their joint names the flat into his sole name. Uh, he wants to serve a Section uh, 42 notice, and um, he hasn't been in his sole name for two years. Can they count uh, the period uh, when he was a joint owner towards the two years? Well, the short answer is I'm not sure. I know there's been a debate in this in one of the textbooks uh, about whether they uh, can count his period of joint ownership, so he's a beneficial owner really, um, uh, towards it. Uh, and I think they said one way, there have been arguments in one of the textbooks I've seen, either both one way or the other. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a uh, court case that has decided this. But um, the person who sent in that question there, please feel free to come in to me offline and um, we can discuss it. Right. Here's uh, another question. Let me just read it. Um, what happens with missing landlords uh, and uh, needing a lease extension? Well, that's something I'm going to cover in the next um, or next webinar. But I'm I'm happy to give some tips uh, now. Give you a taster. The missing webinar. I think if you've got a missing landlord, uh, I think rather than expending professional fees. 
and a premium uh, for a lease extension. If you can get a sufficient other, uh, other leaseholders interested in the building, I'd, I'd go to the um, county court for a vesting order to collectively enfranchise. You need to provide pretty much the same information as you uh, need uh, for getting a vesting order in the county court for a lease extension. But you know, even if you do get the lease extension and you pay the money into court, you've still got the problem with the missing landlord. I think you can get indemnity policies to deal with it when you come to sell, but you've still got the problem with the missing landlord or the missing freeholder. So why not in the first place canvas the other leaseholders to see where they're prepared to join together, pool resources, and go for a vesting order in the uh, county courts to collectively enfranchise in their name, in the, in the name of a company that, that may be set up in the name of the leaseholders. <coughs> right. Um, yes, somebody's asked me about the case in the, we're waiting a, a judgment of the Court of Appeal uh, about intermediate landlords and a notice of independent representation. My recollection is that it's to do with the Howard de Walden estate in Marylebone, and that it, I think it's called a Cordway, A double C O R D W A Y against Cateb, K A T E B. Anyway, we're waiting judgment on that. Ah, here's another question. Somebody else who's got, jumped the gun because it's going to be covered in um, uh, part two uh, of uh, this series uh, of webinars on lease extension. Um, can the uh, competent landlord? the freeholder refuse to complete if there are outstanding service charge arrears? Well, the short answer is yes, they can, uh, they can um, but they can ask for security for them. And what often happens is that any arrears or an agreed amount of the arrears, well, it, uh, the arrears are paid, but if they're disputed, if there are legitimate reasons to dispute it, perhaps because they're not reasonable or whatever, it could be the subject of an application to the tribunal to challenge them. The, an agreed figure for the arrears, the service charge arrears, is paid into an escrow account, maybe operated by one or both of the um, solicitors on either side, and to um, then with that money there, uh, to continue with the dispute about the service charges, but to go ahead with the um, lease extension. Uh, somebody's asked me about um, what if my, my client is a foreign owned company? Does this make a difference to the signature? Um, my recollection is there's a statutory instrument dealing with signatures of um, Foreign by, by foreign companies, and um, if you get in touch with me offline, I can I can tell you what it is. Yeah, I can't quote off the top of my um, head, uh, but uh, I've seen it quoted in the context of uh, lease extension section 42 notices. But I suspect that um, it may not be an issue, provided they've got proper authorities, thanks to the 2014 Act, where somebody can sign on behalf of um, a leaseholder, so long as they're properly authorised. Right, let's have a look. Some more questions coming in. Uh, what well, somebody's asked, how, how do I register the um, unilateral notice against the freehold title? Uh, well, the, the land registry uh, do publish online on their website a lot of useful um, practice guides, and there is in one of the practice guides, I think it's called Leasehold Enfranchisement legislation or, or leasehold reform, um, some guidance about registering the unilateral notice. 
Ah, somebody's asked me about Section 42 notices um, for, for a buyer. Um, well, I'm going to cover this again in part two. I can't cover everything in this part, but uh, the common position is this. If, if the vendor has been the owner for two years such that they could serve the Section 42 notice, then if they're anxious to complete and the buyer particularly is anxious to buy and doesn't want to wait until the whole 93 Act a lease extension process has been completed, the Section 42 notice uh, can be served by the current vendor or by their solicitors on the competent landlord and by means of a formal deed of assignment or deed of transfer, transfer the benefit of that Section 42 notice to the buyer so that they can then continue with the lease extension process up to, up to and including completing uh, the grant of the new lease, notwithstanding the buyer hasn't been the owner for two years. What's important is to get the documentation right. Not just the Section 42 notice, but also the deed of transfer or the deed of assignment. Um, what's important is, that, among other things, to write into it, make sure there's a provision stating that the assignment of the Section 42 notice only bites is only perfected when the transfer is registered at the land registry. It's at that point that the buyer becomes the absolute indefeasible owner. Um, somebody's asked, uh, the freehold title is unregistered, and uh, how do I find out who is the competent landlord and other landlords? Well, um, I haven't covered it in these slides, but you, my recollection is that you can serve a what I call a who's who's notice uh, under Section 41 of the um, 1993 Act, and by that notice, which I think you can serve on, on an agent, you can flush out um, who um, is the competent landlord and any other landlords and um, get information about their titles and that there's an ability to go to the county court to, to compel the recipient of that notice to force them to disclose the information subject to uh, serving a 14-day default notice on them beforehand. Right. Okay, just waiting for some more questions. I'll wait another two minutes. All right, to wait uh, another few more minutes. Ah, somebody's asked me. Um, 
does um, a leaseholder have to pay a deposit after a Section 42 notice has been served? Again, that's something I'm going to cover um, in the um, next uh, webinar. But yes, yeah, at the outset, as part of the cockpit drill, one should have some money available in anticipation of the um, competent landlord asking for a deposit. Basically, um, the competent landlord can give uh, a leaseholder through, through their solicitors a, specific, a notice. It's not in a prescribed force, but form, but it can require them to pay a deposit of 10% of the price proposed in the Section 42 notice, or £250, whichever is the greater. And that deposit, of course, is taken on account of the premium payable for the lease. Um, and what's happened is when the deposit is paid, it, it's held by the landlord solicitor as a stakeholder, uh, in other words, accountable to both sides. And then um, it, it, it um, can be asked for at any time after the um, Section 42 notice has been served. It's returnable uh, if, say, there's a deemed withdrawal um, or an express withdrawal, but the landlord can deduct uh, their legitimate costs, uh, professional fees from the deposit before it's handed back. I think that's um, come to the end uh, of the webinar for today. Um, I'm just going to uh, put up an advert for the next webinar. It's going to be on the 3rd of November. Let's hope you can all tune in again. Um, it's the second instalment, and that's me, Nicholas Kisson. This time I'm going to be talking you through serving the Section 42 notice, so taking you through the contents when drafting it. Now it's committing it to uh, the post or at least getting it to the other side, uh, the competent landlord or whoever. Then there is uh, the scenario onwards, uh, the post service procedure including the landlord's counter notice. We're going to be taking you through terms of the new lease, conveyancing procedure once all the terms have been agreed or decided by a tribunal, and um, I'll elaborate more upon the missing landlord. What we won't do is valuation issues. I'm a solicitor, I'm not a valuer, um, but um, uh, I'm happy to uh, advise if anyone wants to get in touch with me on basic issues regarding valuation. Likewise, please feel free to get in touch with me or uh, anybody else uh, at least over the telephone or in writing um, if you want to um, discuss anything arising from uh, today's webinar I didn't cover or didn't come up in questions. Anyway, uh, it remains me to, to say thank you very much for listening. You've been a terrific audience and um, I'd like to say thank you again. Thank you very much. Bye.